Well, that's a quality mouse pad. Hey! Not just one, but two! Two Falcon Northwest mugs! Oh, and some more coffee. Mmm, coffee. Spare power supply cables, because this is a small form factor frag box. And in here, all of the other stuff you're not supposed to lose. The Wi-Fi antenna, mounting screws, your Windows license. Uh-oh, look at that, four power cords. We know the GPU in here is gonna be serious. Plus SATA, plus extra M.2 mounting hardware, should you add more. So when you upgrade your Falcon Northwest system, don't call Falcon Northwest and say, hey, you didn't send me my M.2 screws. They totally did. You just misfiled them. I mean, when you're getting a Falcon Northwest system, you know it's gonna be a premium experience, right? Look at that, right in the top of the box, because it is a double boxing experience, right in the top, you get this handy diagram. Fourteenth gen. I want you to see how ridiculous this is. It's a box within a box, but then you still have this much foam padding. Look at this. The computer's here. It's tiny. Look at this madness. It's madness, I tell you, madness. This is just the FedEx world we live in nowadays. A pumping iron. All right, so the metal here is quite extensive. The handle is metal. The case is metal. It's all captive thumb screws. It's a ridiculous power cord. I just want you to look at how beautiful the bottom of this is. Like the bottom of this case. It looks like a piece of stereo equipment, but it's a separate, you know, rubber plastic foot thing for sound and vibration dampening. It's a multi-part foot. Now, as you might imagine, when we move into a world with 300 watt CPUs and GPUs that can draw 600 watts in, in a burst, heat management becomes an issue, especially for small form factor builds. And to be sure, this is not an in-case M1 build, but, it is very portable, it's very luggable, and essentially no compromises on performance. Zero, zero compromises on performance. That's what they've put together here. Now, we need to do some benchmarks and testing and gaming, and I'm gonna need a 144 hertz OLED display to do this. Before we do that, let's actually do a teardown and see what we're working with. Not a complete teardown, because I don't want to wreck their thermals, but eh, you know, just sort of get a lay of the land. On top, we've got two type A, one type C, combination headphone, microphone, and a power button. <laughs> top of the case or medieval shield? You know what's amazing about this case? is that it's micro ATX, not ITX. It's built around the Asus Tough Gaming Micro ATX. That also gives us four DIMM slots for maximum expandability, which is nice. We do have more PCIe slots, so theoretically you could do stuff here, but ah, uh, GPUs being three, four slots. Yeah, but you know, that's the case with our RTX 4090. Not a lot of room for anything else. This is configured for dual side intake, and then our radiator, our dual 140 millimeter radiator, exhausts out the top. There is actually a little bit of room for expansion on the inside. Could get some drives or just have a little bit of room for activities. And they're able to keep this thing cool with just four fans plus the fan and the power supply. Two 120, two 140. Now you may have noticed that two of the four total fans that we have, they're in the side and they're side intake. They're custom, 120 millimeter, they're thin and uh, they're designed to bring fresh air in for the GPU. Gosh darn it, they work well. They're at a fixed thousand RPM, so you don't even know that they're on. And that's all you need to cool the Founders Edition 4090. Yeah, four fans total is very, very impressive to cool a system of this class as quietly as it does. Well, okay, you got the fans in the GPU and the fans in the power slot, but I mean, normally with a system like this, when you're building in a tower or something else, you add kind of a lot of fans these days, so 
this is a big deal. The GPU is also mechanically mounted to the case. It's a pretty extreme mounting solution for our graphics card, but in the aforementioned uh, post-apocalyptic universe with shipping that we live in now, this is sort of the minimum that you need to make sure it's gonna get from A to B without damage. Now, this case has unusually sharp corners. I mean, there's folded metal and then there's folded metal, and this is of the latter variety. All right, that's enough screwing around. Let's get benchmarking. Now, Falcon Northwest has a bit of a reputation. High-end, powerful, performance, compact. And I gotta say, I was surprised. This is the first time that I've gone hands-on with a Falcon Northwest system. I'm not usually super gamer enthusiast, but some things about this system stand out. One, this is quieter than any 14th gen system that I've built. The uh, 280 millimeter radiator does its job with the 14700K that is in this system. And the performance here is nearly identical to the 14900K that we tested. At least when we're talking about gaming and gaming focused performance. I mean, yeah, you got some extra e-cores on the 14900K and some extra clock speed, but this is a really nice system. This is pretty much the top shelf gaming build that you can get today. Confirmed. Falcon Northwest has a lot of history as well. Mr. Gordon Ung from PC World, going all the way back a bazillion years, reviewing the original frag box in the, day, the days before internet video and the days before the internet could even really do video properly. And uh, there's a couple little things I've snuck in here as an homage to the OG master in terms of doing reviews, write-ups, and everything else. Hats off to you, sir. And uh, yeah, if you're feeling nostalgic, go check out the ancient original frag box. You, you can tell that uh, not a lot has changed in Falcon Northwest's DNA over the years. This is also one of the first times that the out-of-the-box experience, at least after plugging in the network and letting Windows update run and do its thing, that the Windows 11 built-in RGB controls work. That's probably down to Asus and Aura Sync, and it's more limited than Aura Sync, but you can at least do basic controls directly from the operating system. You, you don't need anything other than the USB drivers installed, I guess. So that's pretty cool. I've never actually gotten the Windows 11 like control thingy to work correctly. Mm. If it were me, I'd rather use the Aura Sync software anyway because it has one critical feature, and that is you can make the color one thing when everything is running cool, and another thing when the temperature exceeds a preset threshold. And you can set that in Armory Crate, so that's nice. You can use your RGB for something useful, status reporting. I, I can dig it. Now the 14, 700, 14, 14th gen in general launch from Intel has been a little strange. Okay, uh, 14th gen, it is from 13th gen to 14th gen, there's not a lot of difference. This is also a system that is capable of supporting a new software feature from Intel called APO. And this is a performance enhancement thing, it's software that runs in the background. The Asus Tough motherboard in here has to provide the DTT driver stack in order to enable that. So it's sort of hardware software optimizations. But for right now, it's only really supported on Intel 14th gen processors. This is a really baffling choice in my opinion. I think that maybe we're just waiting on qualification. Maybe Intel is gonna release this software update for 13th gen because Intel has not really de demonstrated a compelling argument that there's a lot of difference between 14th gen and 13th gen when we're talking about raw silicon or other features. And I would hope that they're not just software locking uh, something for the latest and greatest to try to get you to buy a later CPU, I mean, uh, that, that wouldn't, you know, if you bought a 13th gen Intel, and they're like, oh yeah, we, it's already old news, we don't, we don't care, it's barely a year old, uh, that wouldn't be super awesome for customers. So hopefully there's something coming for that, hopefully that's not the case. I don't know. APO can give you some more performance in two games specifically at the time that I'm doing this video. Uh, Metro Exodus is one of them, and yeah, it does actually work, so that's pretty cool. But the really interesting thing is, this frag box is based around a 14700K. The big difference, you, you lose four E-cores. But for every game that I tried, didn't really make much of a difference. You might see a little difference at 1080p, that has more to do with the clock speeds than the extra E-cores, but the 14700K is the one CPU that actually did get a bit of an upgrade over the 13th gen. It's got four more E-cores enabled. You go from eight cores, the i7 and 13th gen, to 12 cores in the 14th gen. That's pretty cool, but there are not really any other noteworthy changes like that. 
you know, you still got 16 E cores and eight performance cores and the 14900K, exactly the same setup as the 13900K. It looked like a little faster, but otherwise exactly the same. And the, you know, other CPUs down the stack, I mean, the 13600K, it's, it's pretty formidable, but, you know, the i5. So this was of particular interest to me, and Falcon Northwest was more than happy to send this system and uh, satisfy my curiosity around the 14700K. The 14700K in the 14th gen is by far uh, the better value. Uh, okay, the i5 might actually be the best value overall if we're talking about a purely gaming build. But if you want an enthusiast gaming build, the i7, this system, would be my pick for that. Period. Falcon Northwest build quality, RGB controls, and just the fun of it notwithstanding. So, all right, some time passed, and I've been able to enjoy some game time on the frag box. Frag box. Yes. Frag as in fragmentation. Not as in fragmentation grenade, but as in you used a rocket and your opposing player fragmented. This is the box that helps you do that because it runs so well. You see? I like it. It's fine. So let's talk productivity. This is the 14700K. It's a pretty significant upgrade over the 13700K in that it's got four more E cores and a clock pump. And that's basically it. So there's not really a lot that's changed from 13th gen Intel core that launched a year ago and 14th gen, especially when we're talking about the i7. And yet the i7 is basically identical performance for gaming. I mean, yes, uh, productivity is the thing that I want to talk about first and 3D rendering and that sort of thing. The bottom line is that Intel still has the edge for creative workflows, at least on the Windows platform. So DaVinci Resolve, Adobe Premiere. If we look at Puget Bench, the 14900K and the 13900K are going to pull ahead of Team Red. The 14700K, you're only down four E cores. It's basically the same processor. It's actually a little bit faster single thread when we look at single core, multi-core performance in things like Cinebench, V-Ray, etc., etc. And some of that is down to Falcon Northwest's thermal solution and tuning of the platform and the fact that this is DDR5-6400 right out of the box with the super high-end Kingston Fury memory. Fun Kingston RGB. And yes, the Falcon and the RGB controls are RGB. You can do unicorn puke if you want. It's just blue by default. I ran with blue. It's good. It's all good. Well, let's take a look at the very high preset of Assassin's Creed Mirage. Because, hey, that's a brand new game. And the 13900K, 14900K, and the 14700K basically offer identical performance. Whether we're talking about 4K, 1440p. Uh, fun fact, the 1080p place is sort of the only spot you'll really see a difference at 1080p and that's because you're extremely 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 not gpu bottlenecked so the faster you can get frames in and out the higher fps will be so 6 gigahertz 6.1 gigahertz okay yeah maybe you can see that there but it takes so much system cooling to maintain that that what falcon has done here with the 14700k is far more manageable in terms of power and thermals in fact, if you do the power limiting thing with the 14th gen CPUs, just like 13th gen CPUs, you can get 95 to 98% of the performance with 40% reductions in power up to. But that's a conversation, maybe a video with our frag box for another day. Assassin's Creed Mirage, let's take a closer look at those 1% lows. Maybe the 1% lows will give us something. Nope, 14700K right here, you saw it first for gaming. Makes a lot of sense. Cost savings wise, you don't need to spend $700 on a desktop CPU. You can get the 14700K, save a few bucks, but really save on power and thermals and noise. What about an older title like Borderlands 3? Well, I love diving into Borderlands 3 with the Ultra preset. We're doing a lot of fragging in Borderlands 3, don't worry. 141 FPS to 137 FPS, that's basically within margin of error, although it does stack up nicely from 14.7, 13.9, 14.9, but hey, not bad. And 280-ish FPS at 1080p, with 14.40 setting nicely in between the two. Taking a closer look at our 1% lows at our three resolutions, this isn't really the most fabulous way to look at 1% lows, but it gives us a general ballpark. No matter how you cut the cheese, <laughs> we're maintaining above 100 FPS with Fragbox, which is... 
pretty awesome. Now Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that I spent quite a bit of time with because it actually can use the E cores. So the difference between 8, 12, and 16 E cores across all of our different systems. Okay, well, mostly in these graphs, this we're just looking at 16 and 12 E cores. The difference between 16 E cores and 12 E cores, even for something like Cyberpunk 2077, minimal. Very nice, buttery smooth 71 FPS at 4K with the non-ray tracing preset all the way down to a lightning fast to 203 FPS. And yes, you will need an OLED monitor, in my opinion, to enjoy frame rates much north of 120 hertz. Other non-OLED, non-light emitting technologies are just too slow, in my opinion, when you're talking about a refresh rate above 120 hertz. Our 1% lows across the three platforms was also pretty consistent. I was delighted to see that, because Cyberpunk 2077 really can be just a... Uh, yeah, it can be more unstable than a moose on rollerblades. But 50-ish for our 1% lows at 4K isn't bad. And we still maintain over 120 FPS for our 1% lows at 1080p. Switching on ray tracing, but before enabling DLSS, ooh, we're down to about 42, 43 FPS at 4K. Clearly, we are GPU bound here. So the CPU is not having to keep busy. And because the CPU is not having to keep busy, there's not really that much difference. Of course, flip it around to 1080p, and we do see something interesting. There is a little bit of a difference at 117 FPS for our 14700 versus 125 for our 14900K. Cyberpunk can use the E cores, or it needs a little bit more optimization because you shouldn't see this much of a difference between 12 and 16 E cores. I'm not really ready to attribute this performance delta to that probably more down to single thread performance. But keep in mind, our single thread performance on the 14700K is a little higher than the 14900K, at least stock for stock, like for like. And our 1% lows with ray tracing not being too far off our, our other performance shows that we're holding up pretty well. Cyberpunk, since it's gotten the, the DLC update, seems to have gotten a lot more stable. Geekbench 6 for our single and multi-core scores also sort of confirm what I've been saying. The single core score between the 14700K and the 13900K, basically identical. The 14900K is a little bit better, but it's just those fleeting boosts. You can also see how much of a difference losing four E-cores makes in the multi-core performance. It's really not a lot real world, but in benchmarks like Geekbench for multi-core, Cinebench and, you know, if those kind of workloads are important to you, it can make a difference. But outside that, especially when we're talking about gaming, E-Cores really don't matter all that much in most titles. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, an older title, but still over 200 FPS of 4K and over 300 FPS across the board at 1080p. The performance here stacks up exactly like I would expect. The 1% lows is maybe a little bit of a surprise that the 14900K can do uh, a little bit better when we're talking about 1080p, but by and large, the performance is, is identical. I would also call your attention to the FLIR thermal footage that I captured of this machine, as well as our Hardware Info 64 uh, thermal results. It is really darned impressive. Again, very compact build, but very quiet and very capable cooling. Surprisingly capable cooling, especially given the power requirements of the RTX 4080 GPU, plus Intel's 14th gen power requirements there, plus the small power supply. There's a lot that could go wrong in the cooling requirements of a modern machine like this. Falcon Northwest, they've done it right. And that's a pretty reasonable performance breakdown roundup for our frag box. Oh, and I also got in some Baldur's Gate time. <laughs> that's Baldur's Gate 2, not 3. Oh, and in case you're wondering, uh, what frame rate can you expect if you're going to run an ancient version of Unreal Tournament? Literally over 4,000. Okay. Not actually over 4,000, but effectively 4,000. Think of it as some absurdly high number of your choosing. Turns out gaming hardware has moved kind of fast in a relatively small number of years. Overall, the performance is nothing short of spectacular for this combination of hardware. The all aluminum chassis is uh, entirely luggable. It is very well built. It is, it is, it would certainly be an attractive system at any LAN party or or anything like that that you wanted to attend, or even if you just travel a lot, do you want to take this back and forth between a couple of different setups? It's pretty luggable, pretty powerful, and a lot easier to work on, in my opinion, than an ITX system. A lot of options for upgrades in the future because it's standard power supply, standard motherboard, standard RAM, 
This is running 96 gigabytes in two DIMMs. So it's sort of the best of both worlds in terms of capacity and everything else. If you were thinking, oh man, the LGA 1700 is going to top out at 128 gigabytes of RAM. No, right now, currently it's 192 gigabytes of memory, but 96 gigabytes of memory is going to be able to run a DDR5 6400 all day long. Two DIMMs per channel. If you wanted to have 96 gigabytes, you know, two 96 gigabyte kits in this platform for 192 gigabytes of memory total, you could do it. But when you do that, the DDR5 memory speed has to come down for stability. So 96 gigabytes is the current maximum sweet spot for LGA 1700. And that's probably going to be true for the foreseeable future. I bet you next gen DDR5 platforms, they don't even bother with two DIMMs per channel because, you know, for DDR5 8000 and beyond, it's a bit of a headache to get two DIMMs per channel working. It's a lot easier to get DDR5 8000 and beyond working when your motherboard physically only has wires for one DIMM per channel. And at 96 gigabytes of memory with most games really sitting comfortably in that 16 to 32 gigabytes of system memory range for a normal desktop, 96 to 128 gigabytes in two DIMMs is reasonable. So overall, what's the verdict on our Falcon Northwest system? Well, once again, Falcon Northwest has seriously impressed me with the build quality, the no compromises performance, and just the little smart features that they've put into their case. I mean, this frag box looks like the same frag box they've been selling for 10 or 20 years. Okay, roughly the same. I mean, it's obviously not transparent plastic, but they've amped up the manufacturing. It's, it's an aluminum handle. It's, it's nice. It's got an aesthetic. It's got a nice aesthetic. <laughs> I get why Falcon Northwest shows up in movies. I like the system. I really have enjoyed the performance and uh, it really is something else. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. Signing out, you can find me in the Level 1 forums. If you have any questions about this or you want to see a deeper dive or maybe do some other testing on it, maybe dual boot to Linux or something like that, let me know. I'm signing out and you can find me in the Level 1 forums. So what the hell is an aluminum falcon? Northwest, that is.